Deputy OD. Uh, before I commence, just to remind you if you have mobile phones, you might turn them off, please. Uh, Minister, you and your colleagues are very welcome. Uh, the purpose of the meeting is to consider the proposal that Dáil Éireann approves the terms of the Convention on Social Security between the Government of Ireland and the Government of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland done on, at Dublin on the 1st of February uh, 2019. The proposal was referred by the Dáil to the Select Committee on the 12th of February with a requirement to send a message to the Dáil in the manner prescribed in Standing Order 90 no later than the 5th of March. Uh, Minister, obviously we had your attendance yesterday, so we have a good understanding of what's in this convention. Uh, so, but we'll start first with your opening statement, please. Chair, and thank you, colleagues. Um, I want to thank the Committee for the invitation to discuss our Convention on Social Security that was recently signed between the Government of Ireland and the Government of the United Kingdom. And in the context of Brexit, my objectives is to ensure the reciprocity of social welfare rights and entitlements which currently exist for Irish and UK citizens moving within the common travel area are safeguarded and maintained. And this has been the aim since immediately after the referendum in the UK on the 23rd of June 2016. This is in line with the Government's overall commitment to maintain the common travel area, which is one of our four Brexit priorities. Ireland and the UK share a long history of cooperation and reciprocity in our social security matters, and the principle of reciprocity has been reinforced in bilateral uh, agreements and arrangements on social security between our two countries since 1924 and subsequently in EU-coordinated regulations. That reciprocity is underpinned by the principle of equal treatment so that Irish citizens in the UK enjoy the same benefits as UK citizens and vice versa. These rules are designed to protect people moving and working between each state and to minimise any disadvantages that they might experience. From a social welfare perspective, maintenance of the status quo through safeguarding and preserving that very reciprocity of us is of crucial importance to me, my department officials and indeed our government. Because of the unique nature of the common travel area and the associated rights and privileges which it provides and will continue to provide for Irish and British citizens in each other's countries, it was agreed that Ireland and the UK would formalise the pre-existing common travel area social protection arrangements in a legally binding <coughs> agreement. Last year, I met with the then UK Secretary of State and Work for Pensions and we agreed the objective of ensuring that the reciprocity of social welfare rights and entitlements which currently exist for Irish and UK citizens moving between Ireland and the United Kingdom under the common travel area are safeguarded and maintained. And since then there has been intensive work at, a at official level in order to develop and to finalise the agreement to underpin these arrangements. That agreement was signed on the 1st of February and is now subject to the ratification process in both Ireland and the UK and indeed that's why we're here today. And under the terms of the agreement, all existing arrangements with regard to recognition of and access to social insurance entitlements will be maintained in both jurisdictions. And this means that the rights of Irish citizens living in Ireland to benefit from social insurance contributions made whilst working in the UK and to access social insurance payments if resident in the UK are protected and vice versa. There are approximately, Chair, 132,000 people in receipt of a UK state pension living in this country and approximately 1,000 people receiving child benefit payments from the United Kingdom for children residing in Ireland. There are 28,760 people residing in the UK who are in receipt of a state pension contributory from Ireland. 840 people residing in the UK are in receipt of full rate child benefit payments from my department. And these payments are in respect of 1,830 children, 95% of whom live in Northern Ireland. A further 920 people residing in the United Kingdom are in receipt of child benefit supplement payments from my department in respect of 2,010 children, 97% of whom reside in Northern Ireland. And we want to ensure the continuation of these payments and that's the purpose of the bilateral agreement. The agreement means there will be no change to social welfare payments which will be continued to be made as usual. Where payments are made from Ireland to the United Kingdom or from the United Kingdom to Ireland, these arrangements will also continue. And it means our citizens can be absolutely sure that their social welfare benefits and entitlements will remain exactly as they were and are before Brexit. 
As part of the ratification process, the agreement was laid before the Houses on the 7th and the 8th of February, and it was subject of a dull motion on the 12th of February, as a result of which we're here today. The motion has a return date, as you've uh, expressed, Chair, of the 5th of March, and once the parliamentary procedures are completed, letters of exchange will be arranged, and the Convention will be brought into effect by way of a ministerial order. The ratification process in the UK is also underway, and it is expected to be completed by the 29th of March. If there is a no-deal Brexit, then the Convention will be required to come into effect immediately. If there is a deal, which we all still very much hope that there will be, then the Convention need not take effect until the end of all of the associated transaction periods. While I am confident that the ratification process will be completed in both jurisdictions before the 29th of March, Chair, uh, I want and we absolutely need to be certain that export of payments of benefits between Ireland and the United Kingdom and vice versa can continue in the event of a no-deal Brexit, even if all of the necessary steps in the ratification process are not completed by that date. And therefore, it's prudent that we proceed with Part 11 of the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the European Union Consequential Provisions Bill 2019, which we discussed here yesterday. These amendments to the Social Welfare Consolidation Act of 2005 are also designed to maintain the status quo in the common travel area with respect to social welfare arrangements. I've also included amendments to the Protection of Employees, Employers Insolvency Act 1984, which provides for the insolvency payment scheme. And that scheme covers wage-related entitlements of employees who are employed in Ireland by an employer who has become insolvent in Ireland or another EU member state, which will include the United Kingdom. Once the United Kingdom leaves the EU, employers in the state of insolvency under the laws of the UK will not fall under the scope of the Act. And that means employees of those employers who work and pay their insurance in Ireland would no longer be covered by the protection set out in the Act unless we make the amendments to Section 12 of the Miscellaneous Bill. The purpose of the amendments in this part of the Bill are to ensure that those employees will continue to be covered by the scheme in the event of a no-deal Brexit. In the uh, economic uncertainties which may prevail in a no-deal scenario, I think it's vital that we continue to provide this protection to workers in Ireland, and that's why we're introducing this amendment to the Bill. The Government has discussed this proposed legislation throughout our meetings in January and February, and its provisions were also subject to intensive and daily engagements with the departments and our Parliamentary Council. And as outlined yesterday, the Government expects to publish the full Omnibus Bill tomorrow, February the 22nd, and it is our intention that it would go before the Dáil for second stage next week, the 26th to the 28th of February. It could go through Dáil Committee and report stage from the 4th to the 8th of March. And it will then go on to the Shannon for second stage on the 11th and 12th of March, followed by committee and report stage in the Shannon on the 13th and the 14th of March. And thereafter, back to the Dáil if there's a requirement for amendments. Chair, the Convention is an essential element in the maintenance of the status quo of our common travel arrangements uh, that we've enjoyed for many, many years. And it brings certainty to an area which affects so many of our Irish and British citizens. And I appreciate genuinely the support of this committee and your cooperation and our efforts. And I hope that it will ensure that the ratification of this Convention uh, will be done by our Parliament and indeed the passing of the miscellaneous legislation in the next number of weeks. So thank you, Chair, um, and I'll be happy to respond to any questions that the Deputy Thank you, Minister. Yeah. Deputy Brady. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Uh, thanks, Minister. I know you gave a a very thorough uh, overview of, of uh, the legislation and the convention yesterday. So, look, I, I'm not going to dwell on, on, on too many points, but obviously the, the, the figures that you give here this morning and you gave yesterday just show us how important this is, the, the certainty and the, the seamless um, transition um, through, I, I suppose, very uncertain times for, for, for everyone. Um, and the figures you, you, you give there, um, you know, show how, how important it is. I just want to, um, I suppose, hone in on, on one specific area, um, and that is the, the, the whole uh, provision there about overlapping. Um, and I have uh, some concerns, and I hope you might be able to allay, allay those uh, this morning, because Minister you would be aware that in 2012 there was a, a European um, court uh, ruling which allowed uh, people who had worked in uh, Britain um, to avail of, of the winter fuel payment. And that has been paid, I, I, I think there's approximately 132,000 people who are eligible uh, to uh, apply for the, the, the British uh, winter fuel payment. And that 
um, can vary from between £100 up to uh, £300, and, and certainly it is um, you know, a, a very important payment for those people. Um, and of course, um, that particular ruling um, didn't stop um, people qualifying for the Irish uh, fuel a, a, a allowance also. So I'm just looking for clarity with this overlapping um, because I, I, I read through uh, the document, I, I've read through it all, um, and there's no specific mention anywhere of uh, the winter fuel uh, uh, payment um, anywhere in it. So just can you give uh, clarity as to whether uh, the overlapping there is going to uh, do away with that, um, you know, that people can only qualify for one payment here, whether it's the Irish fuel allowance or, 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 or the British uh, winter uh, fuel payment. So a bit of clarity would be helpful. Deputy Brady, Minister. <coughs> So the drafts of the bill, uh, which is the miscellaneous bill, not the convention, um, there is a head that includes the motion of avoidance of overlapping of benefits. What we're doing is, is maintaining the current rights and obviously what we want to do is to try and avoid the situation that we had um, a while ago and I think that ambiguity arose because there wasn't any legislation that particularly prescribed um, one of the heads of the bill that will be drafted or that will be published tomorrow uh, will detail how we intend to avoid it but that doesn't mean that it necessarily won't be open to challenge. Um, but we're prepared and hoping that we will be able to prescribe in law that you can't avail um, of something in both scenarios. Obviously, we want to maintain um, what we have in this instance, um, and I think this is an essence of trying to perfect what we thought we had before it was undermined by the European, European ruling um, of, with regard to jurisdiction rights of both people in the United Kingdom and Ireland uh, to apply for each other's fuel allowance a number of years ago. So uh, the head, draft head, uh, is going to include a motion of avoidance um, of overlapping benefits, but we will be maintaining the current arrangements and we're not changing the rules for anything else. So you will be seeking to change that, is, is basically what you're saying, where, where people won't be able to um, avail of, of, of both payments. Will that be really concerning for a lot of people? Um, so look, obviously we, we'll wait till we see what is actually in the legislation once it's, it's, it's published tomorrow, but I, I, I would have... Uh, concerns there. So look, we, we, we'll wait, have a look, um, but I, I, I think it would be of, of grave concern to, um, you know, the 132,000, um, I suppose, Irish uh, people who worked in, in, in the UK, if, if we're being told there's going to be no changes, that is a, a huge change for, for the many people. A lot, a lot of people aren't aware that they, they could actually um, qualify for, for the winter fuel payment in, in the UK. I do know a large number actually do, and, and you know, um, in accordance to the ruling by the, 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 the European uh, Court of, of Justice in, in, in 2012. So look, I am concerned. I'll, we'll have a look at the legislation um, t t tomorrow, um, but I, I, I would have concerns in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chair. Just first of all, apologies for yesterday to the Chair and the Committee. I couldn't make it to the meeting. Um, I suppose this is a part of just the transition um, of a no deal or a deal in some form. Um, can I just ask the Minister, uh, it's very tight there, 13 and 14 to set Shannon and then back to the Dáil, 29th of March. Um, if, we do, if it is a crash out, if there's no deal, uh, you mentioned it there in your introduction, um, no deal, there, there, there might be a problem. Did you say that? Can I just get clarity on that then? Because that's what I need clarity on. And also, after the 29th of March, if is there a no deal or a deal, um, what's in place for future changes? Is there agreement that if there's a problem that comes up between the UK and the Ireland in relation to social security, that there is an arrangement there to be able to deal with that? Sure. So, um, what we agreed when we met last... March, I think it was, when I went to the UK to meet uh, the then Minister Esther McVeigh, the principle um, that we agreed that would be set out in the Convention was that we wanted to continue doing exactly what we have been doing for donkey's years. Uh, and both the officials in my department and her department have worked uh, and finalised that agreement towards, uh, finessed the agreement towards and finalised it towards the end of December. Uh, and that agreement was signed on the 1st of February. What the agreement does, and it was part of the withdrawal agreement, so it was actually detailed in, in Protocol 20 that, that we were to do this and we had the blessing of everybody and it was grand. So that in the event of a deal that there would be an orderly transition 
uh, with regard to continuing legally and in a lawful way to do what we've always done with each other's citizens um, for a long, long time. Um, in December, when things looked maybe a bit ropey, that there mightn't be an orderly Brexit, the government made the decision that we needed to put in place contingency plans to ensure that we had all and enjoy the rights within the common travel area um, that we won't want to continue to enjoy after a no-deal Brexit, and that's where this piece of legislation came. And so we started drafting the heads of the legislation to replicate everything that was in the Convention, which obviously is, is just exactly the same um, status quo on March the 30th as we have on March the 29th. And, whilst we were, and so we started that in December, and that was in the event of a no-deal Brexit that this new piece of legislation would give me the legal basis to continue to pay uh, what we've been paying. Now, since we started drafting that bill, Deputy Collins, um, the Convention was uh, completed. It was signed off on the 1st of February. And we have now discovered that since the Convention processes have started in this Parliament and in the UK Parliament, um, I actually don't need Section 11 of the bill because I can, by regulation, because the ratification process has started in both parliaments and there is the goodwill and intention to complete it, that even if it's not completed by the Irish or the UK parliaments before the 29th of March, I can by regulation um, legally instruct my department to continue paying, as can uh, now uh, the new minister in the United Kingdom, Amber Rudd, legally continue to pay because we are in the process of ratifying. So in essence, the double assurity of the legislation that I thought I needed I now don't need because we've already started the ratification process. Now, we're going to finish the ratification process today. You're going to send a message hopefully back to the doll, and then our part will be done. The process in the United Kingdom is slightly different insofar as that they have to lay the convention before their houses for um, 21 days of a cooling off period. And that cooling off period will finish. I'm sorry, the reason for that is, is to allow their MPs to make uh, submissions or objections or enhancements or whatever you know they want to make um, or just make comments on it to something called a standing a privy, council. privy council sorry um, that privy council is meeting on the 13th of March and their cooling off period finishes on the 19th of March and if there are no changes to be made obviously then they will ratify it on the 19th of March or thereafter and if all of that happens well then we don't need worry about anything if it doesn't happen, what will have to happen is, is that I and the Minister for Work and Pensions in the United Kingdom, Amber Rudd, will both have to sign a regulation to say, given that we're in the middle of this ratification process and it hasn't just been completed yet, we'll sign regulations to allow us to continue paying what we've always paid until the ratification process is legally binding because we'll know it'll happen within a matter of days or weeks, obviously, of the exit date uh, of the 29th of March. And so most likely what will happen is although I will go ahead with Section 11 um, of the Bill, it's not going to need it to be commenced, uh, but I will have to go ahead with obviously Section 12 with regard to the insolvency um, requirements and, and securities that are needed in that. So I know it's kind of a little odd, but then I think the situation that we're in is very odd. Um, but either way, what I want to guarantee you is, is that on the 29th of March, people will have the securities and the rights exactly as they have on the 30th of March and thereafter, not, notwithstanding which, me which mechanism we use uh, to ensure those rights are continued on the 30th of March. Minister. And is there anything in place for future changes? Sorry, or so it's a bilateral agreement. Um, bi obviously, yeah, it can be changed and adapted yeah, at any okay. stage. And what we talked about yesterday, I can't remember, oh, I think it was um, Senator Higgins asked me. Okay, so the, the paid parental leave bill at the moment um, isn't on our statute books, but if it was, it would be included in all of the um, list of schemes that we have currently uh, in the bilateral. Okay. So I suppose at some point in the future, if we have parents who are taking paid parental leave bill and they live in the United Kingdom but work in Ireland, we will obviously adapt mm. it. But what we want okay. to do is to continue to enjoy the friendly relations and the securities that we have with each other, with Irish people living in Britain and British people living in Ireland for many, many years to come, please God. Sorry, Jim. Sorry, Deputy. That's fair enough, yeah. Minister, can I just ask you uh, around the ratification <laughs> process? If the rat our ratification is, uh, I suppose, in our hands. The UK one isn't in our hands, and we have to assume it will happen. But you made the interesting point that if the ratification process isn't complete, payments will continue because you can issue uh, a regulation, be because ratification is in process. How long can you uh, work under that regulation? 
Is it time specific or is it open ended? I think it's open ended, but I mean, it's not going to be open ended for everywhere. It, the principle is, is so long as that the, the goodwill exists and the intention exists of both parliaments. And so what you would obviously have to appreciate is, is that as long as the intention has been laid out by Esther McVeigh, Amber Rudd and obviously the UK government is that we want to do this doesn't change, well then you would expect the process to continue. But we'll know very quickly if there's a problem with the process, but I don't expect because there's nothing... No, but I suppose the point I'm making is because... Will we find ourselves here this time next year? I don't think so, no. No, and that's why, the regula that's why having Section 11 in the legislation is important. Yes. Okay. So it's not, I, I know... I know, seems, I know you might have enacted it, but yeah, it's... It, it might seem futile, but I think it's, it's the double lock. I know we'll pass it, and it's no different than what's in the Convention, and it may never, ever be commenced, but I need to have it in the back pocket. But you may need it in, in time to come if... God forbid if there's a general election in the UK before ratification is complete yeah. or something, something along those lines. Yeah, just yeah. in case. OK, thank you. Anyone else? Deputy Brady. Just, I suppose, one supplementary question in, in, in relation to the overlapping. I, I've identified one there, the winter fuel payment and, and the fuel allowance. Does the Minister see other areas that, you know, um, this specific, I, I suppose, um, head in, in, in the bill is, is going to be looking at in, in, in terms of overlapping? Are there other areas there that the, other than the, the, the winter fuel allowance? Well, you see, the way the current situation works is, is that the reason there's no overlapping is because all of the schemes that are based in the bill have a legislative basis, and what we do is we share data. So you can't, for argument's sake, if I use you as an example, you can't be working in Ireland and in UK uh, subscribing a contribution in the same week, and so there is no overlap with regard to anything else that re requires a contribution. Um, the winter fuel allowance in either Ireland or the UK doesn't require a contribution. It's an additional add-on and it doesn't have a legislative basis. And so that's why there was an anomaly and that's why we're going to move to secure that there will be no overlap in the future. I don't think there was ever the intention of an Irish government or a British government to have rights and entitlements that would overlap in the first instance. Um, and so what we're going to do is to ensure that in the regulations that this uh, anomaly doesn't obviously occur again. Okay, so it's, it's specifically aimed at the, the, the winter fuel payment. Everything else re re requires a contribution. The winter mm -hmm. fuel allowance isn't a, contribu con a contributory payment. It's an allowance mm -hmm. that's given towards obviously fuel poverty. So it's slightly different. There's no legislative underpinning. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Dr. Collins, you're happy? Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent. Uh, Minister, thank you. And by the way, thank you for your comment yesterday where you said you would notify those who we know to be affected because all of a sudden Brexit for a lot of people has become very real um, and where there's uncertainty, um, I think you, you have a role to play in the known people who'd be affected to, I suppose, clarify the, the steps, the proactive steps you're taking to ensure that their payments continue. And that concludes the consideration of the proposal that Dáil Éireann approves the terms of the Convention on Social Security between the Government of Ireland and the Government of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, done in Dublin on the 1st of February 2019. In accordance with Standing Order 90, a message to that effect will be sent to the Clerk of the Dáil. Again, Minister, I'd like to thank you, for your, uh, you and your officials for your attendance today. Um, and that concludes the business here. The Committee is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.